Um, so we are still in the book of Judges. Um, we are going to be looking at a, an individual that uh, some may know, um, but he doesn't, he doesn't come up a lot in the scriptures. In fact, the first time I heard of this person was when I read the book of Hebrews. Um, so his name comes up in the book of Hebrews. So Hebrews chapter 11 uh, is known as the hall of faith, uh, because in there, the writer lists out a number of individuals uh, that walked by faith and that we are to read them and be encouraged by them, be encouraged by their lives. And, and so Abraham is in here. Moses is in here. All the greats that we would know of, Rahab is in here. And, and he, he lists them out in Hebrews chapter 11 and then talks a little bit about kind of what they did. And then he gets to verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 11. And it's kind of almost like he's going, I, I wish I could say more, but I don't have time. All right. I wish I could say more, but I don't have time. And so he says this, and what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon, whom we've covered, Barak, whom we've covered, Samson we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. And then he says, Jephthah. And then just kind of continues, David and Samuel and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword. But, but there we find uh, this individual, Jephthah, and we're not told too much about him until today. See, Jephthah is one of the judges that we find in the book of Judges particularly from Judges chapter 10. And, and he, he has a very interesting story, a very dark one, a very sad one, which is very much our series, our sermon series, Hope in the Horrific. How do we find hope in the horrific? And what happens here is absolutely horrific. And so if you have a Bible, meet me in the book of Judges chapter 10. But before we jump in, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me, that God would do that which only he can do, and that is save many. And so, Father, we come to you asking uh, that you would meet us where we are. Lord, I pray that my words would submit to your word, uh, that my heart this very moment would submit to your heart, God, I ask that you would open us up so that we might truly see you for all that you are, that you are seated on your throne, fully in control. Remind us again through your word that we are in desperate need of a Savior, and that Savior has a name, and his name is Jesus. Help us, Lord. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. So if you've been tracking with us, uh, you know the cycle, right? The, the Israelites turn away from God. Things go horribly, horribly wrong. And then they cry out to him and then God sends a judge. That's kind of been the cycle and it continues. Judges chapter 10 verse 6, it says, Then the Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They worshipped the Baals and the Ashrathists and the gods of Aram, Sidon, Moab, and the gods of of the Ammonites, the Philistines. We see seven gods here that are worshipped. Seven is an important number in the Bible. It speaks of completion. And yet here when we see the seven false gods, it tells us that here the Israelites had, had completely abandoned God. That, that's how bad things had gotten. They abandoned the Lord and did not worship him. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he sold them to the Philistines and the Ammonites. They shattered and crushed the Israelites that year, and for 18 years they did the same to all the Israelites who were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Amorites in Gilead. The Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim. Israel was greatly oppressed, greatly oppressed because of their sin. 
So what do they do? Verse 10, so they cried out to the Lord saying, we have sinned against you. We have abandoned our God and worshipped the Baals. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 says this, for my people have committed a double evil. They have abandoned me, God says. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that cannot hold water. That's exactly what the Israelites have done here. They've abandoned God, and and now they've kind of created their, their own idols. Seven false gods. Another way to think about it is seven strongholds. I've said this before, but let me read it to you again. See, behind every stronghold is a lie. Every lie, a fear. And every fear, an idol. Which we have carved by hand, or it was passed down to us generationally. When we or our ancestors rebelled and surrendered to some power, seeking comfort or protection, provision, etc., etc. Behind every stronghold is a lie. And behind that lie, a fear. And behind that fear, an idol. And the, the, here the Israelites had, had, had these false gods that came with idols, putting their trust in them and not in God. They had dug up cisterns. A cistern was uh, this, this contraption that, that they would get water from. But, but here in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, God says that they are broken. So, so the water is, is muddy. What is meant to be a stream of, of, of flowing, healthy water, it's now muddy. But you convince yourself that this is still good water. Think about it for a moment. It's like you're drinking muddy water and you're looking up. I mean, your teeth are brown because of the mud, but you've convinced yourself that this is healthy. This is what's happening here. This is what happens to all of us. Verse 11, the Lord said to the Israelites, When the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sardinians, the Amalekites, the Moanites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, did I not deliver you from them? But you have abandoned me and worshipped other gods. Hear this. These are scary words from God. Therefore, I will not deliver you again. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them deliver you whenever you are oppressed. Go to your gods, since you are putting your trust in them. Cry out to them. Let them deliver you. Go to your career. Since you you love it so much, you, you, you worship it. Go to your money. Since you believe that it it, it can save you, your title, your relationships. Here's one for all of us, your schedule. I mean, mean, think about it. It's it's, it's insane that that in the times that we live in, the the word busy, we, we wear it like a badge of honor. Oh, sure, I'm so busy. So busy. You know what you're doing in that moment? You're actually saying, this is how important I am. In fact, if if you are not busy, then you go, well, what's wrong with you? Are you lazy? I'd like to, let me show you my schedule. I'm fully booked. I mean, the fact that I'm even here, you guys should be, I mean, huh? I showed up this Sunday, guys, and I'm I'm so busy. God says, then, then go to your God. Of busyness. Looks, our accolades, these things cannot save us. They cannot save us. And so here we see God say, I will not deliver you again. God essentially says, No. They cry out to him and he says, No. Why? I, I thought God was loving. 
I thought God was gracious. Why would he say no? Well, because God is aware of their false repentance. God can see right through them. God can see right through us. And here he says, no, no, no. I hear you crying out to me, but you actually don't want me. You actually don't want me. This is false repentance. God sees right through them. God says no to an abusive relationship. That's what he's saying. He says no to an abusive relationship. And this is the worst kind. I mean, any abusive relationship is horrible, but this is the worst kind because here the abuser is lying. They fully know that they're not going to change. They just want, like, I just need you to sort out the situation. I promise I'll change. No, you won't. No, you won't. And friends, hear me, there's nothing wrong. I, I, I say this every Sunday. Like, come, God knows that you're not perfect. We are not perfect. This is not a perfect church. But what we are doing is pointing one another to a perfect Savior. So come. But oh no, this is the third time. Yes, God knows, come. This is the 50th time. Yes, come. But it's how you come that matters. It's how you come that matters. It's, it's like saying, you know what, I, I, I don't want to look at those images again, but you keep the app on your phone. How, how then are you changing? How you come matters. And so God says, no, I see your heart. But in verse 15, things change. But the Israelites said, we have sinned. Deal with us as you see fit. Only rescue us today. See, something changes here. They they go, you know what? Okay, it's okay. We've sinned. Deal with us how you see fit. We're not going to come to you and say, well, this is how you should do it. We're going, it doesn't matter, God. Just, just, Just come. Rescue us today. Something changes in their hearts. We see that change as we continue to read. It says, so they got rid of the foreign gods among them and worshiped the Lord. Are there any gods that you need to get rid of today? And I say this every week. Because I know, I know how life is. Like you'll come on a Sunday and you'll hear a message and you'll be convicted and you'll be like, no more, no more God. And then by Wednesday you find yourself hanging around that false idol again. I know how it goes. And so this morning, again... The call is to get rid of that false idol. Whatever it is that you are hoping will save you, you need to let go of that because it will not. Only Jesus can. This is why every Sunday I, I, I plead with you after the gathering. Come, come and speak to someone. Come and sit here and pray. God, I, I don't want to continue like this. Behind every stronghold is a lie. Behind every lie is a fear. What are you afraid of? Because behind every fear is an idol. Chapter 11, we see God intervene. He he hears their cry and he sees that like this is this is now real. This is now real. And so God intervenes. Judges chapter eleven, verse one, Jephthah. The Gileadite was a valiant warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute, and Gilead was his father. I mean, sometimes when I, when I read the book of Judges, it feels it's like it's the bold and the beautiful, right? Or like sand through the hourglass. So are the days of our lives. Gilead's wife bore him sons, and when they grew up, They drove Jephthah out and said to him, you will have no inheritance in our father's family because you are the son of another woman. God chooses to use Jephthah. This should tell us that it doesn't matter how your story began. It should never matter about how your story began. Some of us were like, God could never use me because, I mean, here's how I came into this world. God used Rahab. God can use anyone. 
So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Interesting name. Then some worthless men joined Jephthah and went on raids with him. This word worthless it doesn't mean that they were useless. It means that they were, they were ruthless men. Jephthah had a, a gang of men and they became mercenaries, hired help. So if you needed some help, you would go to them and these guys would get the job done. They were like mercenaries. Some time later, the Ammonites fought against Israel. When the Ammonites made war with Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. They said to him, come, be our commander, and let's fight the Ammonites. Oh, how the waves change. They, they had kicked him out, but now all of a sudden they're like, hey, we, we, we need some help. Maybe Jephthah and his mercenaries can, can help us. Jephthah replied to the elders of Gilead, Don't you hate me? Didn't you hate me and drive me out of my father's family? Why then have you come to me now when you are in trouble? You see how Israel treats Jephthah? It's like how they treat God. We can throw you away, but then when we really need you, when times are really hard, we come back. Please help us. They use and abuse. I love how they respond, though. Verse 8, they answered Jephthah. That's true. All right, so at least they're honest. That's true. Uh, but now we turn to you. Come with us. Fight the Ammonites, and you will become leader of all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jephthah said to them, If you are bringing me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them to me, I will be your leader. He agrees. He says, fine, I, I will do it. Uh, and then in uh, verse 10 to 11, he tightens up the contract. T's and C's apply, right? It's very, very important. He, the people made him their leader and commander, and Jephthah repeated all his terms in the presence of the Lord at Mizpah, right? So he says, hey, listen, I just want to make sure, because I know you guys. You love me today, you hate me tomorrow. Then from verse 12 all the way to 28, we see Jephthah now sending a messenger uh, to the, the king uh, to try to negotiate. Hey, listen, we shouldn't be fighting. Let's figure this out. Uh, what he actually does is he begins to unpack to the king of the Ammonites uh, why they are wrong. See, the Ammonites want the land that, that the Israelites are on. And he says, no, hold on. Actually, it's not your land. He unpacks, and he, he, he does so by, by going back to history. He, he unpacks how they ended up here and how they are the rightful owners of this land. Land is a big deal. It's a big deal. It's not something that, that, that only now we are talking about. It's not a recent thing. This goes back all the way to Genesis. Think about this. When God made promises to Abraham. He promised him an heir, yeah. blessings, and land. Yeah. Now, you might be going, oh, this is great. I wonder if Anu is going to tell us politically which side he's on. No, I'm not doing that. If you want to know which side I'm on, uh, you can invite me to a fantastic meal and we can have a great conversation. But the point I want to make is that land matters. It matters. And so Jephthah is explaining to the king of the Ammonites, he's going, no, hold on, listen, let me tell you why uh, we uh, belong here, why this land belongs to us. Walks him through history. And then right at the end, he, he then calls him out and he says, uh, he calls out the king of the Ammonites. He says, well, listen, if your God is that powerful, why doesn't your God then just give you the land? Right? And he calls him out. And I, and I love that. A little bit of history and a little bit of theology. Friends, you should know your Bible. You should know your Bible. He then says in verse 27 of Judges 11, I have not sinned against you, but you are doing me wrong by fighting against me. Let the Lord, who is the judge, decide today between the Israelites and the Ammonites. 
See, I believe in this one statement, this is why Jephthah gets inducted into the hall of faith. Because other than that, Jephthah's not a good dude. He's not a good person. He, he, I mean, he is shady. But this one statement here is what I believe gets him in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. When he says, the Lord is the judge. I know this to be true because in verse 29, we're told that the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. It's upon making that declaration that God goes, okay, then I will use you. And the Spirit comes on him. They then go to war. They fight and they win. But before they do that, Jephthah makes a vow. In verse 30, Jephthah made this vow to the Lord. If you, which is really strange, because if you're really trusting God, do you really need to say, if you? If, I mean, if he said, I'm going to do it, then, then, then why utter these words? But he makes this vow. If you, in fact, hand over the Ammonites to me, whoever comes out the doors of my house to greet me when I return safely from the Ammonites will belong to the Lord. And I will offer that person as a burnt offering. Seems strange. But like I said, they went to war and they, they won. And as Jephthah is now returning back home, verse 34, when Jephthah went to his home in Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with tambourines and dancing. She was his only child. He had no other son or daughter besides her. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, No, not my daughter. You have devastated me. You have brought great misery on me. I have given my word to the Lord and cannot take it back. If we read the rest of the chapter, we see that Jephthah goes on to offer up his daughter as a burnt offering to the Lord. This is quite rough. It's quite sad. And to be honest, it's very confusing. I mean, I have so many questions and my hope is that so do you. One question I have is, why did Jephthah make this vow? Why? Why would he make this? But God's, God's, God's going to do it. He says the Lord is the judge. The spirit came over him. Why then make this vow? And, and I ask this question because I believe from the fact that he was devastated that he, he had no desire to offer up his daughter. It's clear in the text. But he did have a person in mind. That's also clear in the text. See, remember verse 31, whoever comes out the doors? So why? Why, Jephthah? Why would you make this vow? Well, it's because Jephthah was desensitized to violence. This was a common thing back then. And before we judge him too quickly, I don't think we're that much different. Violence has become a part of our lives. I mean, we hear about it all the time. Oh, something happened and you're like, oh, that's horrible. But we live in South Africa. It, it's, it's become a part of our lives. And in many ways, I believe we've cheapened the definition of violence. It's become so common to us that we've cheapened it. You, you want to hear one of the most violent words I believe we possess? Because I believe we are violent people. It's this phrase. Be true to yourself. Yeah. I want you to think about that for a moment. That phrase is incredibly violent. Just, just be true to yourself. What, 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 what that phrase is communicating is 
do whatever you want, do whatever makes you happy. Just be true to yourself. It doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter who you hurt. Just be true to yourself. It's incredibly violent. See, we don't think that we are violent people because we think too highly of ourselves. We, we compare ourselves to, to the, the criminal who's in prison right now. It's like, well, then... Comp- but if you compare yourself to what God says in his word, you are incredibly violent. Be true to yourself. Do whatever it is that you want. See, yourself outside of God is dangerously violent. That left to your own, let's be honest here for a moment, left to your own, you're a violent person. Your thoughts, what comes out of your mouth, what you do with your hands. And so this is why Jephthah could easily make this vow. He was ready to kill someone. A common thing. Why make this vow, Jephthah? Well, another reason is because this is how you pleased false gods. That was the practice back then. To to, to offer up people. As we continue to read the book of Judges, I mean, we're going to see some really, really horrendous things. But, but, But this is what happens when sin takes over. This is how you pleased false gods. The greater the favor, the greater the sacrifice. And this is evil, friends. And this evil is born out of idolatry. I mean, if if Jephthah knew enough of the Torah, of Moses' words to be able to, to say to the king of the Ammonites, hey, hold on, let me tell you how history works. Actually, this land belongs to us because of this and this and this. If he knew enough of those words, then why did he not know Deuteronomy 18 verse 10? Where it says, never sacrifice your son and daughter as a burnt offering. So, so again, the Bible is clear. But remember, they had turned away from God. I believe he would not have done this if he had truly believed in God. Now, I know some of you might go, well, I hear the verse, but what about Abraham and Isaac? Great question. The difference is, with Abraham and Isaac, that was a, a test of faith and obedience. That's what it was. What we see here, this is an attempt to bribe God. There's a difference. This is an attempt to bribe God. And and friends, don't we do that? God, if you you really come through for me, if you come through for me, then, then, then this is what I will do. God, if you provide, if you provide, then this is what I will do. Instead of, God, your word says this, and I want to live in obedience, and so therefore I will do it. There is a massive difference there. And yet we find ourselves trying to bribe God. God, if you, if you provide here, if you, if you move this mountain here, if you move, like then I will do when it... It's faith and obedience. This is why Jephthah makes this vow. But, but another question that we could ask is... Then, why did he keep it? It's one thing to make it. But why, why did, I mean, you see your daughter, you, you realize what you now are, are going to do. Why not just go, you know what, it's, it's okay. I'm actually not going I'm not, to, I'm not, there's no ways I can do it. Why? Why keep the vow? Well, quite simply put, it's because Jephthah had no concept of grace. He had no understanding of grace. No concept of God's grace. See, Jephthah had an interesting faith, a faith that I believe many of us have. He he knew some things, and then he would add other things from other places. He he knew some things of God, but then he, he would do these other things, these practices, 
that they would do with false gods. In the fashion world, um, when you put something together and it's completely wrong, uh, I spoke to a PhD in fashion, so I believe this is to be true. They call it a fashion faux pas. It's French, right? That was my attempt at French, faux pas. It's a, 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 a false misstep or a wrong step is what they say. It's like, uh, it's, it's like if you put on anything and then wear Crocs. <laughs> All right? Right? That's a, that's a fashion misstep. Uh, that, is, that is a no-no. Um, if you... If Matt, my wife says it's not. I'm telling you now. Uh, if, you, if you wear Crocs and you showed up to church today, I want you to receive this as a word from the Lord saying to you that Crocs is a no-no. Friends, there's someone out there making tons of money going, I can't believe that they went with it. <laughs> like these rubber shoes with holes in them. Like, and I'm making a killing, right? So, but, but, but you know when you look at someone and you go, why did you put that on and that on and that? Like, none of this makes sense. See, Je- Jephthah had a, a faith like that, where he took some things from God and then he took some things from culture and he took some things from a false idle practices and some things that he, he created uh, for himself, things that made him feel comfortable. He, he had this, this, this kind of faith that was a little bit of everything, but to be honest, it was absolutely nothing. Many of us have that. I, I hear this phrase quite often. No, I'm not a Christian, I'm just spiritual. What does that mean? Well, you know, uh, I take some things from the Bible and there's some things I don't like, so I leave those out. And and then I take some other things from culture and history and and then some things that I love. And I believe this is acceptable to God. This will leave you like Jephthah. He had no concept of grace. See, he had created a contractual God instead of a covenantal God. A contractual God instead of a covenantal God. And again, friends, before before we think this is only Jephthah, this is us. A faith that goes, you know what, I do, God, then you do. And, and if I was to be honest, we prefer a contractual God over a covenantal God. B- because then it's, it's, about, it's about what I do and how much I do, and then now God owes me. God, I showed up on Sunday. That means you need to open that door. God, I, I, I tithe. So that means you need to find me a husband or a wife. God, I I serve the church. Think about this for a moment. That is why I believe I can watch those things that do not glorify you. God, God, I I labor in your word. That's why it's like I can can afford to be greedy. We'll probably never say that, but our hearts are yelling it. We prefer a contractual God instead of a covenantal God. But that is not the God of the Bible. He is a God of covenant. See, there is no amount of work that you and I can do that can earn us favor from God. No amount of work. It is by grace and grace alone. God God gives because he is merciful and because he is gracious. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 to 9. And he does so so that none of us would boast because he knows us. Oh, look at me. Look what I, I, I said it last week. I, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. No, you didn't. There is no amount of work that you and I can do that can grant us favor from God Jephthah had no concept of a God of grace. Jephthah should have never kept this vow. 
let alone make it. He should have just repented. As he sees his daughter, he should have just gone, who on earth do I think I am? God, I repent. I turn away from these practices, this, this, this faith that I have created, and I turn to you. Some of us need to repent today, in this very moment. We think we have this deal with God. You don't. You don't. You don't understand grace. And here's the scary thing. Not understanding grace might mean that you're not even a Christian. And so you live this life, this, this life of pretending and performing. The call is to repent. The call is to turn away from that life so that you might turn to Jesus. Faith is the only way to please God. Faith. It's Jephthah going into that battle in faith. It's you showing up here in faith. It's you sharing the gospel in faith. It's you giving in faith, serving in faith. Faith is is the only way to please God. You want to to make an offering to God? Offer faith in Jesus. You want to make an offering? Offer faith in Jesus. And here's the crazy thing, and I wish we had time, but here's the crazy thing is that that faith isn't even yours. It's, It's nuts to think about it that way. That God loves us so much that he goes, you know what? On your own, you can do absolutely nothing. Nothing. And so I will do. I will do. Judges 12. The men of Ephraim were called together and crossed the Jordan to Zephon. They said to Jephthah, why have you crossed over to fight against the Ammonites but didn't call us to go with you? These guys. I mean, if you were with us last week, the same thing, right? They show up to Gideon. Hey, man, why why didn't you call us? They, They want all the glory for themselves. And so they say, we will burn your house with you in it. What? Then Jephthah said to them, My people and I had a bitter conflict with the Ammonites. So I called for you, but you didn't deliver me from their power. He's calling out the tribe of Ephraim. He's doing what Gideon could not do. So Gideon wooed them. Jephthah's like, no, I did call you. You didn't come. You're all talk and no action. You know anyone like that? When I saw that you weren't going to deliver me, I took my life in my own hands and crossed over to the Ammonites and the Lord handed them over to me. Why then have you come today to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all of the men of Gilead. They fought and defeated Ephraim. Well, I guess they weren't that tough because Ephraim had said, you, you Gileads are Ephraimite fugitives in the territories of Ephraim and Manasseh. Here's the crazy thing is that all of these people are family. You're fighting one another. You're fighting your own family. And and you thought the church was messy. This is crazy. But this is how bad things have become. And so they go to war with one another. We're told thousands of people died. At that time, 42,000 from Ephraim died. This is pointless because of wounded pride. Friends, the point I'm trying to make here is that when we turn away from God, things go horribly wrong. That our idolatry kills. It destroys us and it destroys people around us. That here you'd think, okay, the, the Ammonites, he's defeated the Ammonites, great, right? It's all done. Let's live in peace. No, then we turn to one another. We turn to, and then we start fighting one another. 
Idolatry kills. Sin is like a cancer and it spreads. Cancer has, has, has one desire and that is to destroy. That's what sin does and that's what idolatry does and we need to be careful and the first thing we need to recognize is that God is the one who is seated on his throne, not us. We need to recognize that the faith that we have is a faith that has been given to us by God. That we have no business changing it and trying to add to it and take away from it. Because that will only lead to idolatry. And then we need to be honest about our struggle with grace. It's hard, I know, especially for a church like ours with highly competent and highly educated people, to be given a gift and to say, no, no work. It's a gift. It's a gift. That's what grace is. It's a gift. Oh, but I need to work for it. No. It's a gift. Because when we recognize grace and understand grace, it allows us to live in this world. It allows us to navigate through the challenges that we face It allows us to deal with the sin in our lives. Some of us, we carry guilt and shame because we don't understand grace. Anger and bitterness because we don't understand grace. It's at the foot of the cross that we let it all go, knowing that we have been forgiven, that the blood of Jesus covers us. That there's no need for us to try to bribe God that you are loved more than you could ever imagine and we look to the finished work of Christ to see that. And so the question this morning is, will you receive that grace? Will you let go of the pride that you are holding on to? God already knows your life. He knows all your imperfections, all your weaknesses, all your shortcomings. He knows what you did last night. There is no need to hide with God. He looks at you and he says, yes, and I still love you. Come. We just sang it, lay it all down. Lay it all down. Because what you pick up is a living hope. A true hope, a real hope. And so, Rooted, I'm pleading with you, as I do every Sunday, that you would let go of these idols your career and your money and your accomplishments and, and, your, and your degrees and let go of these and take up Christ. And so I'm going to call up the band and they're going to sing the last song. But, but as we sing, friends, I, I, I've said it before, this is not Christian karaoke. We're not here and then they're performing for us and we, but, but that you would actually meet with God. My hope is that you would meet with him that there would be a real and true encounter with him. And so if you have never crossed the line of faith, you know that you're not a Christian. Well, today, in this very moment, is an opportunity for you to receive grace from God. And all you have to say is, I surrender. I surrender. I'm laying it all down. But if you have crossed the line of faith and you've been walking with Jesus for a while, maybe, maybe you're that person who's, who's added to the faith. The question is, what have you added and why have you added it? That thing that you have added, it's got to do with the fact that you're not trusting God for something. And so you've taken matters into your own hand. Repent. Jephthah's given to us so that we might see what not to do. Trust in him. He is a forgiving and gracious and loving God. He's a God who wants to heal and restore and reconcile. And right now is an opportunity for you to do that. I know some of us, we think, no, 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 tomorrow, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it next week, I'll do it, I'll do it when things get better in my life. We are not promised tomorrow. We are not promised later. What we have is right now. And so, Father God, we come asking, pleading, crying out to you that you would rescue us. 
rescue us from ourselves. Too often we think the enemy is out there, but, but, but the evil happens in our hearts. It's when we turn away from you and no longer trust you, when we believe that you are either not good or you are not powerful. God, those are a lie from Satan himself. He feeds us these lies so that we might become fearful. And so God, I ask that you would liberate us this morning. Liberate us this morning. Lord, help us to live as free people. Children of the kingdom. Where we grab onto every promise that is yes and amen in Christ. We have a living hope. And so we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for what you did for us. We deserve death. We deserve punishment. We deserve to be separated from God the Father. But you came and lived the life that we should have lived. And then you died the death that we deserve. And so as you are right now seated at the right hand of the Father, you're praying. You're praying for us. I pray, Lord, that that people would let go this morning. Let go of the shame. Let go of the guilt. Let go of the anger bitterness the unforgiveness let go of greed pride selfishness so that we might be able to take the gospel of grace receive it as the gift that it is we ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful name